Jesus instituted our observance of communion by telling us that every time that we come together to do this in remembrance of him. So this isn't something that we do out of necessity. This isn't something that we do just to say we crossed it off the list. This is an opportunity for us to commune with our Savior, with our the lover of our souls, with our Redeemer, with our Deliverer, with the one who lifts up our head off of our own circumstances, our own limitations, and points us to the Father. This is an opportunity for intimacy with him. And I want to, I want us to remember him in a slightly different way than we normally do it when we take communion here. I want you to think of something that the Lord has done for you. I want you to think of some time when he came through for you, whether it was healing or financial breakthrough, whether it was a relationship that was restored, whatever it is, whether it's big or small, somebody else, it's significant to you. I want you to think about that. And if you're somebody who's saying, you know, I really, I can't think of anything. There's no con condemnation for you in that. There's no problem with that. I want to tell you that before the world was created, before any of this was here, planets, solar systems, stars, the Lord had you in mind. God has been thinking of you for millennia and beyond. He has been planning and strategizing how to reach you, how to touch your life, how to touch your heart with love, with freedom, with peace, with joy, with everything that he is. And if that isn't something that just touches your heart and humbles you and makes you feel like, man, what a beautiful God that out of the billions of people, not just the ones that exist now, but the ones who have existed and lived throughout all time, God has had his mind on me from before the time that he even created the world. If you were able to think of something, I'd like you to take just a quick moment, if you can, and share that with somebody sitting near you. I want you to tell somebody right now what that was. If it's really complicated and long, I've got tons of testimonies like that, like, hey, sit down, grab a coffee. I'm going to tell you all about it. Obviously, we don't have time for that. But you can just summarize it and say, he healed me, or I needed this financial breakthrough, and he totally met my need, or he restored this relationship, or he just touched my heart with his love. Whatever it is, just summarize it and communicate it to somebody. We are called to be witnesses we're called to just communicate what we've experienced and what we've seen of God to one another and to the world. And more and more, we need to be a people that communicates. We don't just hold it in and keep it to ourselves. There's a world that needs it out there. There are brothers and sisters who need the encouragement. So right now, just take a couple of moments and just find somebody and share with them what the Lord did for you.
could you uh, could you turn on the wireless mic for me? in remembrance of him of our savior the Bible refers to Jesus as our older brother we're part of his family so with that testimony of what God did for you still fresh in your mind remembering that this reveals his heart for you who he is who he was and who he will be to you just partake in the elements just take the bread or take in the cup and just remind yourself that he has made you one with him. He did it and you benefit from it. Church. My name is Jeremy Flanagan. I'm an associate pastor here. It's my pleasure to tell you that you are welcome here, that I don't think that it's chance or happenstance that you find yourself here this morning. I believe the Lord has something beautiful to communicate to your heart, to share with you. <laughs> Maybe you've already experienced something beautiful. I, I think I have already, but I just have this expectancy that God always saves the best for last. So let's see what there is. Amen. 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 If there are any kids that want to be dismissed downstairs, you are dismissed right now. If you want to hang out up here, you're totally welcome to do that too. I don't know if they had children's church in the first century. I think it was just a bunch of families and children and a lot of distraction and somehow they just managed to still have awesome powerful times of worship and teaching and training and encouragement we want to give you uh well actually before i go there let me ask is there anybody who's visiting with us for the very first time today if that's you would you raise your hand it looks like everybody is returning good to have you back with us we want to give you an opportunity to give. Our ushers are going to pass out envelopes. If you need one, just raise your hand. If you're making out a check, you can make it payable to the Oasis of Light Church. Thank you, thank you again for all of your generous giving. The way that it enables us to keep doing what the Lord has called us to do is just such a blessing to us and to other people. As we do that, I'm going to just continue through our announcements. We're always looking for people to share their testimonies. Like I said earlier, we need to know what the Lord is doing in, in your life. Other people need to hear it. There's, uh, there's an encouraging, there's a, an, it's like a prophetic declaration. When you talk about what the Lord has done for you, you're seeding the ground. You're seeding the atmosphere for other people to experience what you've experienced. So it's really important. Um, Danny, do you want to come up and share Mary's testimony? We've got a testimony to share this morning. You know, listening to the worship service this morning and reading and uh, the song, the words to the songs. And, you know, sometimes 
and I'm guilty of it, come to church, sing the songs, kind of looks like it's a little rote, and, but you don't really realize the life that's in that music and then in the songs until you are confronted with a battle. Yep. And then you realize how much life is in the Word of God in these songs. You know, and my wife and I, Mary, we've been going through some difficult challenges, health issues on her life, and uh, in a nutshell, just in a real brief nutshell, uh, she had some oral cancer done, uh, oral cancer, oral surgery done about uh, 60 days ago. Well, there have been many complications, and because of those complications, she's been in an extremely amount of pain, and the doctors are saying that type of surgery within seven to 10 days, the pain should begin to diminish. And they were not listening to her cries of, there's so much pain in my mouth. And they thought it was just because of the surgery. And so here recently, um, they were beginning to hear and listen to her because she realized there was, you should not have all this pain. And anyway, that's been a real battle. Uh, this week alone, um, she was putting in her contacts in, in the morning to go to work. Uh, one of the contacts broke in her eye. She couldn't get it out. Went to work anyway at the end of the day. Her eye is just hurting, extremely painful. So we'd elect to just go to the emergency room, but uh, she will, and they referred us to another facility where they had a doctor there that can look at the eye. Couldn't find anything, and she went to her eye doctor in the morning, and anyway, so got past that battle. The other day, she woke up, uh, the room is spinning, she's nauseated, lots of different things, back to the emergency room, and um, they're saying that she, has, she had symptoms of vertigo. So it's been one thing after another, and in those times where she's in a lot of pain, we're in the emergency room, you know, we've just decided that we're not gonna stay in the defensive mode we decided to go on the offensive against the enemy. We ground ourselves in the word of God, and we're so proud of her because when she's at home, she asked me, well, what book would be a good book for me to, to, to read and to encourage myself? And of course, she gets on Joseph Prince's books and, and what have you, which is really, really good. But uh, I gave her a book by T.L. Osborne, Healing the Sick, because that's where we're at. And she just, we just took the offensive, we take communion daily daily, two, three times a day. We get into the word, we feed ourselves a word, and we make a declaration to the devil, he's a defeated foe. We're not moved by what we feel, we're not moved by circumstances, we're not moved by what we see. Because if we are moved by that, our head will give us fits. We're defeated, we're gonna stay sick, this pain's not going away, our finances are being drilled, going to these emergency rooms, it gets expensive. So the devil's going to pay back sevenfold what he's stolen because he's a defeated foe. And so when we take our authority that's been given to us, no matter the circumstances, we are victorious. We are more than overcomers because of the blood of the Lamb. And as Pastor John and at Oasis of Church, what we always are preaching and confessing that it is a finished work. The complete finished work is available to us. It is our inheritance in the Lord. And the devil is a defeated foe. He knows it, but more importantly, we know it. And so we put him in his place. And I stand here today telling you that we have the victory. In every facet, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Mary shared that testimony about the uh, vertigo with me, and she she was just filling in some of the details, and it sounded just horrific. And she said that the breakthrough, at least the physical manifestation of the breakthrough, came one morning. She'd been dealing with those symptoms all, you know, there hadn't been any change. They'd given her different medications, several different medications to try to address the extreme vertigo and nausea, and nothing really, nothing really knocked it out. She said she woke up one morning and she just had this internal like witness. She almost heard herself saying, I believe that when my feet touch the ground, I'm gonna be healed and I'm not gonna experience any of these symptoms anymore. And that's exactly what she experienced. She stood up and all of it was gone. And this is after the doctors told her, this isn't the kind of thing that just goes away 
overnight. You know, this could take, you know, weeks to totally clear out. So it's totally supernatural. And it's just such a beautiful testimony of standing in what the Lord has told us. It's so important to know his word, to know what the Bible tells us, what Jesus models for us about healing, about victory, about how to respond to attacks of the enemy. Um, It's so important to hear and be sensitive to the voice of the Spirit. And we're going to be talking about that a little bit today uh, and uh, further on as we get into the spring. Um, But thank you so much, Danny, for sharing that. Um, I encourage you, as you hear that, don't just hear it and then forget about it. Hold on to that. Remember that. If you're confronted by something, remind yourself, man, God's no respecter of person. He did this for Mary. He'll do it for me. You know, it's like Peter, when they they healed the lame man, when they were going to the temple to pray, Peter said, you know, men of Israel, why are you looking at us as though by our own uh, power or holiness we made this man walk? It's not because of anything to do with us. It's about the name of Jesus Christ and putting simple faith in that name. Amen? Amen. If you have a prayer need, uh, we want to make sure that you know that we are here for you to agree with you. The Bible says where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in their midst. Now God is always with us, but there is a special presence of God, uh, an atmosphere that's created when you've got two or more believers gathered together in his name in agreement. So if there's something, if there's anything that we can pray with you about, we want to do that. We're going to have prayer ministers standing right over here at the end of the service. So please, if you need something, don't leave here the way that you came. Next slide. Our next home group meeting uh, is coming up this Friday, uh, February 9th, at Yolanda Vargas' home. Yolanda's information is up on the screen, so if you're interested in finding out more about that or attending, you can get in touch with Yolanda. Always, we're always looking for volunteers. There's a sign up sheet on the table at the base of the stairs. I want to take a moment to just thank everybody who is already involved in serving here at the Oasis. We have such a faithful team of people who are just rock solid, steady, just doing the work week after week after week. And I know that we don't do as good of a job as we should of expressing our gratitude and just telling you how important you are how awesome it is that you just let the love of God flow through you. You're so generous with your time and your effort. Just thank you so much. Uh, You don't know, you won't know the impact of what you've done until we get into eternity. Um, God is just such an awesomely grateful God. He is is grateful. God experiences gratitude. And I believe that there is just going to be this amazing revelation that God shares with us of his gratitude towards us for the ways that we have ministered to his children, ministered to him. It's just, it's going to be amazing. Our first discipleship evangelism class happens this Tuesday, February 6th, and then it continues weekly every Tuesday after that. It starts at 6.30 and wraps up at around 8 o'clock. It's here at the church. It is free of charge. Um, Discipleship evangelism is a curriculum. It's a set of lessons developed by Angelomic Ministries, covering the basics. Uh, it starts with the basics of salvation and the Christian faith, and it goes on to cover really thoroughly all of the tenets of uh, the Christian faith. So salvation, water baptism, baptism in the Holy Spirit, um, healing, the gifts of the Spirit. I mean, it's just really thorough. So this series is going to just be walking through those lessons it's a great, great opportunity if you're looking to just understand more of God and what he has made available to us. There's a sign-up sheet on the table at the base of the stairs. If you're interested, just fill that out and be here on Tuesday at 6.30. Uh, now is a great time, let me do that myself, to silence your cell phones if you have one. Silent. And let's, uh, let's dive into the message. Uh, Pastor John is out of town. He and Miha, I think he told me that they're in Arizona at like a hot springs kind of place, which sounds really nice right now. I hope they're having an awesome time. Pastor John is just like week in, week out. That guy is just a preaching machine. He's ready in and out of the season. 
I know that I could like break into his house and drag him out of bed and just be like, preach. And he'd just, he'd just go. He'd just come rolling out. He'd have something awesome. And I'd sit down and just be like, wow, that's amazing. Uh, it takes me a little bit more preparation, but I have prepared and I've got something uh, to share this week. The last couple of weeks, Pastor John has been talking about the vision of the Oasis of Light, but especially the last two weeks, his message has uh, touched on the topic of speaking in tongues. And I want to dive even deeper into that because it's something that we haven't really taught on very much here. Uh, like I said, John talked about it the past two Sundays, but this is such a rich component of our faith. There is so much edification and encouragement and power available in speaking in tongues. And I just want to take today, this, this service, to just talk about that. So I want to talk about the benefit of tongues, personal and corporate, because there are two primary ways that tongues functions and ministers. It ministers on a personal level where you're speaking in tongues and it edifies you, it benefits you. The other way, though, is in a corporate ministry setting where you are speaking a message in tongues and that message isn't primarily for you, but it's for the edification of the body. It's for people who are there with you hearing it and there is meant to be an encouragement and a specific message that goes forth. Um, so we're going to be talking about both of those today. You know what? I've got a clicker so that I can control. It's not plugged in. Okay, well then, Mary, I will be relying on you to help me. I looked for the transmitter. I didn't find it in there. They're looking for it. Okay, well, I'll just, I've got this in case we find it. I'm sorry? Oh, see if it works. Okay. Nah, nothing. Yeah, we need the transmitter. That's okay. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So let's, let's cover, we're going we're gonna to go through a lot of scripture today, but that's a good thing. Uh, it's going to lay the foundation for our understanding of this, and I believe we're all going to come away from this with encouragement, uh, excitement about this amazing gift that we've been given by God through the Holy Spirit, and a renewed determination to experience this, to avail ourselves of it, to not just let this be some... Uh, idle tool that's in our toolbox, but that it would be something that we use and get the benefit of. So this is, John, this is uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, and John the Baptist is talking about Jesus. And he said, As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. And uh, I love that. Jesus is mighty. There is something really encouraging about that. I feel just a strong resonance on the inside when I just hold on to that. Jesus is mighty. He was mighty and he is mighty and he is, he is mighty on the inside of you. He's not just mighty off in you know, heaven somewhere. He is mighty. He is powerful on the inside of you. It might not always feel that, but uh, it's the truth. John goes on to say, He's mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So this is one of the goals, one of the purposes of Jesus coming to the earth is to usher us into a baptism experience with the Holy Ghost. And that word that's translated baptize, it means to saturate, to immerse. It's like Jesus is immersing us into the realm of the Spirit. He's taking us from where we were before, which is just interacting with this physical, natural realm, primarily. And he is immersing us into a new atmosphere, a new dimension. And that's the dimension of his Spirit, the dimension of his kingdom. Now, anytime that you go into a new territory, a new country, you need to know the language of that country so that you can communicate, so that you can interact, so that you can get things done. And what we're going to be talking about today is the language of the Spirit. Let's go to the next slide. We're going to read through most of the second chapter of Acts. This is the day of Pentecost when the, uh, the group of believers is gathered together in Jerusalem. Jesus has told them, not to go and start ministering, but to hold, to hang out, to wait, to tarry for the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
So we'll start in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves. Remember, John the Baptist said that he would baptize, that Jesus would baptize us in the Holy Spirit and with fire. Well, on the day of Pentecost, uh, there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. So this isn't telling us that this uh, manifestation of the Spirit just picked and chose a couple of people out of the group or some subset of them. No, it says that it rested on all of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. They were praying, but it was the Holy Spirit who was inspiring the message that was coming forth. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together. So people who were not part of that gathering heard this sound and they came to where this was taking place and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them, hearing the disciples, the the believers speak in his own language. So these outsiders, these people who weren't part of the group heard the sound, they came and they heard these believers praying in tongues. But what they heard, they heard in their own language because these were people from other nations and other places who spoke other languages. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? We hear them in our own tongue speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, They are full of sweet wine. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to the men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words, for these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only the third hour. That corresponds to about 9 a.m. in the morning. So he's saying, hey, it's just 9 a.m. It's too early to be drinking. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And in Joel it said, and... It shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit of mankind on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see vision and your old men shall dream dreams. So this is a group of believers who had gathered together and the Holy Spirit for the first time was released on all of them. They received this baptism of the Holy Spirit experience and it manifested through, the, through speaking in tongues. And it, reading the text that we just read, it indicates that every person, every believer that was there participated in this experience. Let's go to the next slide. So there are, there are different kinds of tongues, or different manifestations of tongues. In Acts 2, the passage that we just read, the manifestation of tongues that's taking place there is something that people have called that, you know, this isn't a word from scripture, but this is a word that, uh, you know, theologians or whoever came up with this word came up with to describe it. And it's xenolalia. Let's go to the next slide. Xenolalia is speaking a known human language other than one's own native language. So the, the disciples received the gift of the Holy Spirit and they began speaking a language that they didn't know, but it was a language that was intelligible to these other people from other places. So that is one manifestation of the Spirit, a a manifestation of tongues. I haven't experienced that myself personally, but I know people who have. There is a guy, awesome man of God. He's gone on to be with the Lord, but his name was Dave Duell. Um, He was a minister, uh, moved mightily in the gift of healing. I was at prayer uh, and healing services that he held. I saw legs growing out, like literally. I was a kid. I was like, I got to see this. So I'd run up, like I'd get all up in their personal space and I'd be like looking because this is the stuff that just made my heart burn and I was jumping up on the inside like, man, I believe this. I want to see it happen. And I just saw these amazing, amazing things. He told stories about being in foreign nations, Africa, Russia, times when he would um, start speaking in tongues 
and the, the, foreigner, the foreign nationals that he was there with, they would understand perfectly what he was saying. He had no clue what he was saying, but the people that were hearing him understood completely. And invariably, it was some beautiful message of encouragement or declaring the goodness, the grace of God, the, the testimony of Jesus Christ. So that is one manifestation of tongues. It's not the only one, though. It's awesome. It's out there. But there is another manifestation of tongues that I, we need to know about. There's also glossolalia. Glossolalia is speaking an unknown heavenly language, a language that is not understood by the speakers or the hearers. So that's the tongues that I've experienced, and it's the, the type of tongues and the manifestation of tongues that you see happening most often in church. You are speaking a heavenly language. It's not understood by anybody. I don't care what, what nation you're from. You don't understand it. It is simply an expression of your spirit. Um, and we're going to be diving into 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and we're going to be learning all about the attributes and the aspects and the benefits of this. Um, but those are the two, ma- those are the two manifestations of tongues. Xenolalia, which is speaking a language that you don't know, but it is a human language that somebody from another nation uh, might understand. And then there's glossolalia, where you're speaking a language that you don't know, and no other, it doesn't correspond to any other human language uh, in the earth. Um, Let's go to the next slide. This is possibly what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, where he says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but if I don't have love, love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. It could be that he's talking about, when he's talking about the tongue of men, that he's talking about xenolalia. And when he says, and of angels, he could be talking about glossolalia. I don't, I don't know that I can say that's absolutely, definitely, 100% what he's talking about, but it's a possibility. Um, and I want to point out something else from this verse. He's saying, you know, I could be the most eloquent, even if he's just talking about having eloquence and a giftedness uh, in speaking and sharing and conveying a message and crafting it and just delivering it perfectly. But if I don't have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So... In talking about the gift of tongues, I just want to make it really clear that this isn't about showing off. This isn't about, oh, look how awesome and spiritual I am. I speak in tongues, and man, there's this one time that I was speaking in tongues, and I didn't understand it, but this guy from, you know, Russia, he understood it perfectly. I'm awesome. That's not the motivation. This is about intimacy with God. This is about receiving what Jesus came to give us. He came to baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And there is a reason for this. We we need this. It it meets a need. It serves a purpose. It's it's an important part of our Christian tool set. But I just want to make sure that as with everything else in the Christian walk, the motivation has to be love. Because if that love motivation is absent, it doesn't benefit anybody. It doesn't have any life in it because God is love. Amen? Let's go to the next slide. There's also a difference between the personal gift of tongues that all believers receive with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the public ministry gift of tongues. And that's referred to as various kinds of tongues in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul is talking about the different ministry gifts. He's saying, you know, not everybody moves in the gift of healing. Not everybody moves in the gift of prophecy. Not everybody moves in the gift of um, various kinds of tongues. And he's talking about the way that we function in the body, in, you know, group settings like this, when we're all together and we have the opportunity to minister. I believe that the Holy Spirit if the Holy Spirit is resident in all of us, that means that the full spectrum of the Holy Spirit is present. So we have the potential to move in all of the gifts. I really believe that. You could disagree with me, but it makes sense to me that if the Holy Spirit is in me, that he's there with all of his gifts. But whether it's because of the fact that God really cares about our personality and he crafted each of us with the personality and the passions and the 
inclinations that we have, for the most part, those come from God. Um, it could be that because of that, there are certain gifts that we lean towards. For, the, for example, I primarily flow in prophetic stuff, you know, during worship or when I'm here or anywhere. I, there are times where I just get this, this message, this quiet thing. Sometimes it's just a word. Sometimes it's something more, like a, a more developed idea. But I know it's not from my own mind. It's not the, pro, it's not the result of a logic process that began with me. It's something from the Spirit of God on the inside of me that is meant to be communicated to somebody else. Now, does that mean that when the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of me, that he said, well, I'm just going to come like with one-ninth of myself, you know, because there are nine gifts of the Spirit. So just like one-ninth of the Holy Spirit is in me, and the rest is, I don't know, hanging out or somewhere else. No, the Holy Spirit is in me. I believe that I have access to all those gifts, but God cares about our personalities. I mean, to a large extent, he crafted our personalities. I know that we also shape ourselves to a certain extent, but there are certain things that God put on the inside of you. And I think that there are times where God is just, he just knows like, man, you are going to flow in the gift of you know, prophecy. You are going to flow in the gift of healing. You're going to have the gift of interpreting tongues, and you're going to have the gift of tongues, the ministry gift of tongues. So what is the ministry gift of tongues when you're in a group setting like this? And this has happened here at the Oasis. It hasn't happened too much recently, but historically it's happened a lot. Well, most often it'll be during worship. Just the beautiful presence of God will be there. And uh, kind of naturally there will just be this lull, this quiet, as though we're all waiting for something. And then somebody will begin to give a message in tongues. They will begin speaking in tongues, a language that they don't understand. I don't know that we've ever experienced xenolalia happening here, where it's like, hey, there's this, I don't know, I'm picking on Russians today, but there's this Russian guy, and he hears it, and he's like, whoa, he's speaking perfect Russian from my hometown dialect. That's awesome. I don't know that that's happened, but I think most often it's glossolalia, where it's a heavenly language. But somebody will begin to speak forth this message. And it's not like everybody is you know, just speaking in tongues, but there's one person who begins to share a message. Everybody's hearing it. That is the ministry gift of tongues. There is something that the Spirit of God wants to minister, wants to communicate to us, wants to encourage us, build us up with, equip us with in our awareness and our understanding. And then the... the um, the companion gift to that is the gift of interpreting tongues. So most often, somebody would give this message in tongues, and then there'd just be this silence as we wait on the Lord. And then somebody else who would feel that they have the interpretation would speak up, and they would give the interpretation of that tongue. Now understand, it's interpretation, not translation. It's not a word for word. Well, you know, when he said shandana, that means, you know, glory. And it's an overall explanation of the message content, the idea of the, the message that just came forth. So the, the ministry gift of tongues is for a, a public or a group setting. Um, but there's also the personal ministry that you experience and that you receive from speaking in tongues. So let me just start. So there's a difference between the personal gift of tongues that all believers receive with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the public ministry gift of tongues. Second paragraph there, the personal gift of tongues is for your encouragement and growth. It benefits you. The public ministry gift of tongues is for the encouragement and growth of the church or the body. Or if there's somebody that isn't part of, isn't a believer yet, but they're here and somebody gives a message in tongues, and then somebody else has the interpretation. Or sometimes it can be this, the very person who gave the message in tongues. Sometimes they'll get the interpretation as well. Um, and the, the interpretation really pierces their heart. It just hits them right where they're at. You know, obviously that benefits them. So it's for the church, but it, it, it's for the, the, growth, the church and the growth of the church, right? So let's go to the next slide. We're going to read through most of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Bear with me here. But this chapter is so dense with content and insight into the way that tongues is meant to function both in a group setting but there are also all these insights into what we personally receive from the gift of tongues 
And I want us all to really understand this because I want us all to benefit from tongues, from the gift of tongues and from the ministry gift of tongues. So Paul says, pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts. I can't camp out too long on any of this stuff or else I'll just keep us all here for like another hour and I don't want to do that. Paul, <laughs> through the beginning of this chapter, he says, earnestly desire spiritual gifts. A lot of people are like, you know, that's weird stuff. I don't know about that. You know, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm just happy, you know, just focusing on the word and ministering the word or, you know, I don't want to get off into woo-woo land. Paul is telling us to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. And he says, but especially that you may prophesy. Okay, I'm going to hit pause. Um, epistles are letters written by an apostle to a group of believers. It, is, it has application and content that is for us today, but we also have to acknowledge that when it was written, very often it is written to address a specific situation that existed at a specific point in time. And understanding the context that this message or this letter was written into can often help us properly receive, implement, contextualize what we're reading. It seems like the Corinthian church, they were a church that really flowed in the gifts, but there were some excesses, some imbalances. And we're going to see more of this. But Paul is writing this to kind of correct something that had gone too far in one direction, to kind of bring it into a more balanced place. I feel like sometimes if we're not aware of that, we can take some of what Paul is saying here and then go off the other deep end. And neither one is good. We need to be balanced. We need to be in the center. Paul says, but especially that you may prophesy. So is this Paul saying that prophecy is you know, the best and we should all just want prophecy and nothing else because prophecy is the best, so forget about everything else? No, they're all important. But in the context that Paul is talking about, he's talking about the way that things were happening in the Corinthian church when they got together in a group setting. The important thing that needs to take place in group settings like this is one thing edification. We need to come together and we need to be built up. We need to hear things. Specifically, our understanding, our mind needs to hear things, needs to receive content, a message that goes, you know, goes through our mind, impacts our heart, and finds expression in our life. And Paul is really emphasizing prophecy because prophecy is always a message that is understood by the hearers. Prophecy is awesome because when you're prophesying to somebody, they understand what you're saying. That's really important. Let's keep going on. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands. But in, a, in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. I've heard people say um, that the only legitimate or genuine manifestation of the gift of tongues is xenolalia which is when you're speaking a language that you don't understand, but somebody else who understands a foreign language that you don't, they are hearing you speak in their language. I've heard people say that that is the only genuine or legitimate manifestation of the gift of tongues. You can't agree with that if you're looking at what Paul is saying here, because with xenolalia, a, the hearers, or at least one hearer, is understanding exactly what you're saying. You don't understand it, but somebody else is hearing you speak in Russian, and they, they get the content of what you're saying. Paul isn't talking about that specific type of manifestation of tongues. He's saying, he's talking about uh, glossolalia. For when one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands. But in his spirit, he speaks mysteries to God. That word mysteries, it, it can also be translated hidden wisdom. You are praying the hidden wisdom of God. Paul is saying, I'm paraphrasing, and I'm adding a little bit to it. It's like Paul is saying, listen, tongues is great. But when you're together in a group setting, people need to, there needs to be a message that is understandable to people's understanding. 
or else nobody's going to be edified, and that's not okay. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. When you're prophesying to somebody, this is a great checklist to check the content of what you're saying against. Does it edify? Does it build them up? Does it exhort them? Does it encourage them in, a, in the direction that God is moving them by their spirit? Does it console them? Does it help them deal with a, a, a stress, an attack of the enemy, a loss, an, an injury, a wound? That's the purpose of prophecy. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. The overall purpose of this section of uh, 1 Corinthians 14 is Paul making course corrections to the way that the Corinthian church was doing their group settings to maximize, to increase edification for the church. It wasn't that he was trying to stamp out tongues. It was that he was trying to ensure that more content, more understandable content was coming forth in their gatherings. Let's go to the next slide. Now, I, <clears throat> I wish that you all spoke in tongues. I think that we all can. But even more that you would prophesy. And this is, again, and greater is one who prophesies the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may receive edifying. So I've heard people say, you know, the tongues passed away, that prophecy is greater, and that's the thing that needs to be the predominant ministry gift of the church. Paul is saying, listen, yeah, if tongues doesn't get translated, if it's just glossolalia with no interpretation, then yeah, prophecy is greater because prophecy has the ability to edify the hearers, to build up the church. But if, if there is an interpretation, well, then they're co-equal because what God cares about is the renewal of our mind. It's about building us up, about uh, bringing us into a greater place of understanding and experiencing his life, his power, his goodness, all these things. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will I profit you? Listen, when I, I love speaking in tongues. I speak in tongues all the time. Almost every time there's a worship time, I'm speaking in tongues, worshiping in tongues, because it's just beautiful. It edifies me. Unless you just hear my beautiful voice and just enjoy hearing that, when I'm worshiping in tongues, it doesn't edify you, because you have no clue what I'm saying. And Paul is talking about that. What will I, what will I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation, something God showed me about his word, or a word of knowledge, or a prophecy, or a teaching? All of that, those things that Paul just listed, those are, those are messages that are intelligible, understandable by the, our natural mind. You know, sometimes I fall into the trap of, you know, just talking about how great the Spirit is and really downplaying the mind. God cares about your mind so much. In fact, Jesus is referred to as the shepherd of our soul. Your soul is your mind. It's your mind, your will, and your emotions. Jesus wants to shepherd your soul. He wants to bring it along. He wants to lead your soul, your mind, to places where it can receive watering and nutrition and safety and peace and all of these beautiful things. And Paul is talking about, listen, guys, you're kind of just enjoying this gift of tongues. And it's great. It's so much. I love speaking in tongues. It's, it's tons of fun. But Paul is really saying, listen, you, you guys need to be ministering to people's minds. There needs to be a message that is communicated that's intelligible to the understanding of the people who are there. Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or the harp? This is just Paul's way of saying, listen, there needs, you need to understand what you're hearing in order for it to benefit you at all. For if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? Let's go to the next slide. So also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will, it be, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world, and no kind is without meaning. So he's talking about human languages. And the purpose of all human language is to communicate intelligible, understandable meaning, a message. But, that, but then, I do not, if then, I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be to the one who speaks a barbarian and the one who speaks 
will be a barbarian to me. So it's like we're looking at each other like, I have no clue what you're saying. It's like I'm put in front of like a caveman. I can't understand anything you're saying. So also you, since you are zealous for, of spiritual gifts, notice he's not, he's not uh, rebuking them for that, saying, no, forget about the spiritual gifts. No, he's saying, since you are zealous of those gifts, seek to abound, seek to abound for the edification of the church. The purpose of the gifts is to edify, it's to build people up, it's to encourage. Let's go to the next slide. Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. This is a huge part of what Paul is looking to correct or to course correct here in the Corinthian church. There wasn't enough interpretation of the tongues that were coming forth. I'm imagining, you know, imagine a kid with a new toy. I still remember like on Christmas and the days that followed, like I would get up early to play with those new toys. I just wanted to be playing with them all the time. I would sometimes wake up in the middle of the night to play with the toys. You just want to be all about it for you know a period of time. And I imagine that's what these believers were like. They were just so uh, enamored with the gift of tongues and they were just really just having at it. I imagine, you know, they would have a worship time, then somebody would just and just take the center stage by their you know, forceful, impassioned, convicted delivery of this message in tongues, and there's no interpretation. And that's a problem. Like, okay, great, I'm glad you had a beautiful experience with God. You know, there's this message that they wanted to deliver, and they delivered it, kind of. Um, but Paul is saying it needs to go further than that. Don't just be self-indulgent and, and, and do something that, you know, satisfies something in you, but do everything for the benefit of other people, for the edification of the church. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. And as long as the, the uh, manifestation of tongues that's taking place is glossolalia, again, that's the, that's the tongue, the heavenly tongue, that's not a human tongue that you're, speaking forth, your mind is unfruitful and so is the mind of the people who are hearing you. They don't understand what you're saying. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say amen at your giving of thanks since he does not know what you are saying? Paul here is saying, when he says, how then will the one who feels the place of the ungifted say amen? I think what he's saying is the person who is ungifted, i.e. they don't have the gift of interpreting tongues, they don't know what you're saying, there needs to be an interpretation. So um, there are all these other things I want to jump to, but I need to just keep marching forward and following the progression that Paul has because I think this is just best. Let's go to the next slide. For you are giving thanks well enough Side note, praying, worshiping in tongues is giving thanks to God. For you're giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. Again, the overall thrust of what Paul is uh, looking to, to course correct here is just to maximize the edification of the church. I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. I'm imagining Paul they didn't have cars or bicycles or anything back then. Every he went, he was walking. I'm imagining him just praying in tongues constantly as he's spending 40 days walking, you know, 50 miles or however long it took to walk back then. He says, I speak in tongues more than you all. And I don't mean that, that I don't know if he means more than everybody or more than all of you combined, but he's saying, listen, I speak in tongues a whole lot. So this can't be a denunciation or a, a, you know, down with tongues kind of message. No, he loves speaking in tongues. He's endorsing it. However, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. Is this saying that tongues is useless? No. He's simply saying that tongues is not the best way to edify other people unless there's interpretation. If there's interpretation, great. Um, there are also some considerations of church order, that, that the gatherings would happen in an orderly way. We're going to get to that. Um, Brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. So he's basically saying, listen, it's kind of childish to just indulge yourselves and just speak in tongues because it's fun and it feels good. 
I need, we need to be mature for the benefit of other people. And maturity is what he's walking them into. Let's go to the next slide. In the law it is written, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is, a, is for a sign, not to unbelievers, but for those who believe, or but to those who believe. This has always confused me, this passage. And there are lots of different opinions about what it means, what Paul is actually saying here. I'm going to share my opinion, and I'll briefly mention, or my take on it, and I'll mention some of the others. Um, what I think Paul is saying is about, it, he's talking about the end result of each of the gifts on somebody who is an unbeliever. So then tongues are for a sign. And I'm, I think that he's talking about glossolalia tongues, uninterpreted glossolalia. Not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. The end result of somebody who's an unbeliever who hears uninterpreted glossolalia, heavenly language, is they're still an unbeliever. It doesn't move them from unbelief to belief. But prophecy is for a sign, not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. It takes people into belief because there's, you're speaking a message that is meant to impact the heart. There are other, there are other opinion, opinions about this that um, find a way to explain that tongues is actually meant to be something that is communicated to unbelievers so that they believe, i.e. xenolalia, an unbelieving a uh, person from, let's say, Ethiopia is here, not a believer. They don't know the Lord, but for whatever, whatever reason, they came to the oasis and they hear somebody deliver a message in tongues. The person who's giving the message doesn't understand what he's saying, but this Ethiopian man, he hears it in his language. That is going to be something that really convinces him. I'll put that out there and leave it up to you to decide which one resonates more with you. Paul is saying, but prophecy is a sign not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. You know, in that second way of understanding this, I'm not exactly sure how prophecy is differentiated from uh, xenolalia in that context, because it seems like both of them would be pretty darn convincing. Um, but uh, let's just keep moving on. Therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues and ungifted men or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are mad? They won't understand what's being said. Um, and I, I wonder about the, histori the historic time period that this is taking place in. You know, there have been times where I, <laughs> where I was with Pastor John worshiping, <clears throat> and I'd hear him, um, or maybe I'd just hear him praying, and I wasn't sure if I was hearing him pray in Romanian or pray in tongues. And I'd actually ask him, like, hey, John, was that Romanian or that was, was that tongues? And I was like, no, I was praying in tongues. I wonder if the fact, I wonder if there the, the fact that we're kind of an um, increasingly international, globalized world, where it's not totally unusual to hear somebody speaking another language. Um, I went to London with Bianca several years ago. We were taking the train everywhere. I have never been surrounded by so many different languages in all of my life. We were on a train ride, and on one train ride, I heard Italian, I heard uh, Castilian Spanish, I heard Polish, I think. I think I heard Russian. I heard two different, uh, what sounded like two different um, African languages. I heard so many different languages. Um, I wonder if some of the concerns that Paul is addressing in this passage have been mitigated a little bit by the fact that it's not as unusual to hear somebody speaking another language now as it may have been back then. I don't know enough to, to say that for certain, but I'm just putting it out there, something that I kind of wonder about. Paul is concerned with people who are unbelievers or who don't have the gift of interpretation, hearing people speaking in tongues and them actually being kind of offended, being like, these guys are bonkers. They're off the wall. They're saying stuff that is totally doesn't make any sense. And, you know, it almost like shuts down their heart to be able to receive. I wonder if that's as much of a concern in the times that we live in now, because if you hear somebody speaking in tongues, you might assume that they're just speaking a language that you don't understand, and in a way they are, but um, anyway, 
Therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues and ungifted men or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are mad? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. So Paul is saying, again, bring us back to the importance of having a message, an intelligible message that's being uttered. And he's saying, listen, if there are tons of people giving messages, messages in tongues that aren't interpreted, they're going to think you're mad. But if there are people in the church who are uttering prophecies, then an unbeliever or somebody who doesn't have the gift of interpretation, they'll hear that and it will, it will impact their heart. It will convict them. It will bring them to a place where, they, uh, where they're called to account. Let's go to the next slide. The secret of his heart are disclosed. I just want to say I don't believe that that means disclosed to everybody, where like everybody just knows his business, you know, his dirty laundry. I think that it's God revealing the secrets of his heart to him, or revealing that God knows the secrets of his hearts, and it's just this opportunity to really minister to, to somebody in a place of vulnerability, but in a really good way. And so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. So Paul, again, here, he's making it clear, all of these should be in operation. This should be something that is normal when, you, when we gather together as spirit-filled believers. Everybody, I mean, it's not like everyone has to have each one of these, but, you know, one should have a teaching, you know, normally it's Pastor John, a revelation to share, a tongue, an interpretation. We're a body, and we function together as the body. And the goal is always edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or three, or two at, or at the most three, and each in turn, and one must interpret. So Paul is saying, listen, we don't want to just have... Uh, chaos reigning in the church. You know, imagine Pastor John's in the middle of his message and somebody just stands up and starts giving a message in tongues. And another one stands up and gives a message in tongues because they're like, hey, this is fun. Let's just do it. Paul is saying, no, it needs to be done in order. Um, and at the most, it should be two or three giving, delivering these messages in tongues. And then there needs to be an interpretation. But if there's no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. I think what this is saying, you know, I don't, I don't know how, imagine we're at a, a church service, uh, in a church service, how am I going to know if there's an interpreter or not? I don't know. Um, I think one practical interpretation of this could be, if one person gives a message in tongues and there's no interpretation, even if you think you've got another one, Keep that to yourself because there's no interpreter. Unless you feel like you're going to get the interpretation. If you're confident to interpret your tongue, your message in tongues, then go for it. But again, Paul is saying the emphasis is on edification. We need to speak stuff that people understand. Um, and it's interesting. It says, if there's no interpreter, just keep, just keep silent. Let him speak to himself and to God. So, you know, maybe just... Pray in tongues quietly under your breath. Speak. He said earlier, you know, when you speak in tongues, you're speaking to God. So just just enjoy that. But don't bolt up and give the, give the fiery message in tongues if there isn't somebody who's going to be able to interpret. Next slide. Let two or three prophets speak and let, other, let the others pass judgment. So again, Paul is just trying to make sure that the Corinthian church is doing things in order and it's not just a chaotic free-for-all. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the first one must keep silent. For you, all, for you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. So it could be that you do have a message to give. You feel like the spirit is saying something, but, that mean, but you're still in control of your spirit. I've heard people say, oh, I, just, I couldn't control it. The spirit just took over. Listen, I've had experiences where it felt like, man, the, the Lord, I was experiencing the presence of God so strong, I feel like I couldn't stop it even if I wanted to. But I believe this verse is telling us that you could if you really needed to. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So this whole, like, the spirit made me do it, that doesn't fly. The spirit of God 
you know, I've heard people say, he's a gentleman. He's not going to force you. He's not going to manhandle you into doing something. It's always a, a collaboration. It's a partnership. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So Paul's saying, and listen, this is the way it needs to be everywhere. The Spirit of God is going to manifest himself in, in order and in peace, not in chaos. Having said that, I just want to say, you know, as people are learning these things and are, are um, developing their, themselves in the operation of these gifts, there might be some, you know, rocky moments or, or times, and that's okay. Um, you know, this, this is not us saying that everything needs to be perfect all the time. You know, there's room here to grow, to, to you know, take beginning unsteady steps and to be coached and, and discipled into this in a really mature, orderly, blessingful way. Um, let's go to the next slide. I'm jumping down a couple of verses. Verse 39 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says, Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues. There are a lot of churches that do forbid to speak in tongues. They say, hey, you can do that at home, but don't do that here. You're flying in the face of uh, the Apostle Paul when you do that. And, you know, we're not going to do that. There, there, is a, there is a legitimate and necessary purpose of the ministry gift of tongues in our gatherings. Um, so we're, we're not going to forbid you to speak in tongues. We're going to encourage you to speak in tongues. So we were just, in, in that verse, we were talking about um, the, the, the purpose of the ministry gift of tongues in group settings, what the benefit, the purpose of that is meant to be. And it's really simple. It's edification of the body. Uh, we're going to talk now a little bit about the personal benefit of tongues. What happens to us as we exercise the gift of tongues just for ourselves? Um, there's a lot to say about that. And most of it we've already covered, but we're just going to dive back into a couple of verses um, and look at that. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14, it says, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Let's go to the next slide. So that's telling us that you bypass the limitations of your knowledge. I am so aware of the fact that I don't know everything. A lot of times people come up to me for prayer about stuff, and I have no idea in the natural how to, what to do. You know, I'm still a relatively young guy. But you know what? The Spirit of God on the inside of me has all wisdom. And I pray in tongues a good deal of the time when I'm praying for other people just so that I can hear what the Spirit is saying and pray that. Out. Not just my own opinions and my own common sense, but what the Spirit of God is saying. Praying in tongues allows you to bypass the limitations of your natural understanding. And since your spirit is praying, you know that you are praying the perfect wisdom of God. The Bible says that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Your spirit is connected with God. It is one spirit with the Lord. So when your spirit is praying, it is the perfect wisdom of God. You are, you are completely unaffected by doubt, by negative emotions, by personal biases. When you're praying in tongues, it is like a perfect prayer. Imagine that. That is so powerful. Let's go to the next slide. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2 says, For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. Let's go to the next slide. You actively engage in your union with God. Because the verse that we just read says, when you're speaking in tongues, you're not speaking to men. You are speaking to God. You're having a conversation with your heavenly Father. There's this awesome communion you're experiencing as His Spirit is flowing through you, communicating to Him. He's communicating to you. This is an, a, a way, like an instant way, to start having communion and fellowship with the Spirit of God on the inside of you. There are times when I'm just in a lousy mood. Uh, it, it just happens sometimes. And 
Bianca can like see it in my body language. I emote like effortlessly without even intending to. She can just tell when I'm like in a funk. And something that I do when I'm aware of it enough to like do something about it, I'll just start praying in tongues because this this just just this beautiful opportunity to begin actively engaging in my union with God. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, verse 17 says, For you are giving thanks well enough. Uh, the next slide is going to go into the fact that when you're praying in tongues, you are communicating thanksgiving to God. You're speaking, so you're speaking in tongues is a form of worship. Um, you know, Paul said that he'll speak in tongues and he'll speak with his understanding. He'll sing in tongues and he'll sing with his understanding. Singing in tongues is such a powerful, beautiful uh, experience. Uh, it really is. And we're short on time, so I'm just going to press forward. But man, I encourage you to sing in tongues too. I mean, I do it in the shower uh, when I'm all alone and nobody can like, you know, hold up a, a scorecard and tell me, you know, that was just a six out of 10, buddy. Um, verse four tells us uh, that one who speaks in, to- in a tongue edifies himself. You build yourself up in your faith. When you're speaking in tongues, Nah. when you were born again, maybe even just before that, you received the gift of faith from God. You received all the faith you will ever get right then and there. You already have it. If you're born again, I can tell you confidently, you have the full measure of faith and you can't get any more. What I believe this is telling us though is that you are, it's like you are installing the faith from your spirit into your soul, this realm. Your spirit has no problem walking in faith. That's the perpetual native way of thinking in, of the spirit, right? But our mind is what needs renewing. And I believe that, that when, it, when the Bible tells us that you're building yourself up in faith, it's like you're taking what's in your spirit and you're bringing it over into the realm of your soul, your mind, your will, your understanding. And man, we need that so much. Praying in tongues, again, I believe that it takes what's in your spirit and it helps install it or manifest it in the realm of your soul. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I think I copied a slide or duplicated it because we already talked about you giving thanks. So it's a form of worship. Yep. Um, Okay, so this is Jude. It's one of those one chapter books of the Bible. Verse 20 and 21 say, But you, beloved building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. How do you do that? By praying in the Holy Spirit. You maintain yourself in the love of God. I don't have time to go into it, but I, in my lifetime, I've dealt with uh, depression. I've never treated for it, never got diagnosed, but I mean, I used to just have such uh, dark times, even as a kid. And as a kid, my, the way that I would respond to it would be to start cleaning. <laughs> Some of you are like, man, I wish I had a kid who was depressed like that. <laughs> um, uh, it was like, man, inside I feel out of control and it feels like my world outside is out of control. This is one thing I can do to control something. I can bring order to something. So I'd go clean, neat and stuff. Part of it was tied to my relationship with my parents because there's kind of a lot of performance stuff. Um, Praying in tongues is something that has helped me so much over the years of my life to help pull me out of the depths of despair and depression and help me experience the joy of the Spirit. And not just momentarily, but to overall shift the trajectory, the overall trajectory of my internal world. I encourage you if you're somebody who deals with that, with depression, to begin praying in tongues as much as you can. I don't think that you can do it for very long without beginning to experience a shift and uplift in your emotional realm. Let's go to the next slide. Ephesians 6, uh, 17 to 18 says, And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, with all prayer and and petition, Pray at all times in the Spirit. The next slide says, uh, mentions that these verses follow Paul's charge to put on the full armor of God. Now, I've heard ministers um, 
state very um, confidently that praying in tongues is actually part of the armor of the spirit. I think it's an interesting consideration. I don't know that I'm ready to start saying that that is absolutely the case, but to, at the very least to me, it's really interesting that right on the heels of talking about this, the armor of the spirit, that Paul talks about praying at all times in the spirit. Let's go to the next slide. Verses 10 to 11, so earlier in that chapter, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Let's go to the next slide. I believe that, that um, Paul is kind of saying that tongues is part of the overall um, tool set that we have to help us establish ourselves in God's strength not our own, and to stand firm against the devil's tricks. Schemes means basically tricks. Um, he's a defeated foe, so the only way that he can accomplish anything in our life is to just trick us, get us to believe a lie and just lay down. Uh, you know, this congestion I'm experiencing, that's a lie. I don't deny the fact that, yes, I'm congested right now. What I deny is the superior, superiority of that condition over the word of God, over the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, over the fact that the Savior lives on the inside of me and he brought all of his healing, all of his health, all of his wholeness. That's a superior reality. I'm sorry. Um, that was a, a rabbit trail. But um, So this, is, this slide is just a summary of all those benefits that we just mentioned. And I'll just, we'll leave it up there for a moment. But praying in tongues is so so, so beneficial. It is so important. I believe that it contributes to our maturity as Christians. I believe that it can help us um, experience a, a greater faith walk where we're just living and speaking and responding to life from a greater position of strength, I mean, of faith, of confidence in God and what he's done for us. Um, you know, Paul instructed us in uh, in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians that we should pray that we interpret when we speak in tongues. So when you do that, when you couple praying in tongues with interpreting in tongues, we just ask the Father. And I did this earlier, to, or last night actually. I was praying with Violet. She's got some some flu symptoms too. And I was just starting to feel some anxiety. And I know, man, God doesn't want me experiencing any anxiety. Uh, the Bible says that he will put him in perfect uh, peace whose mind is stayed upon him. So I just started praying in tongues as I was holding her and I asked the Holy Spirit, man, just give me an interpretation of what I just prayed. And the Lord just started talking to me about how he has installed Violet into a position of victory. And this is something that totally resonates and confirms something because Violet has, the, uh, the, it's been prophesied over her that she has an anointing for victory. Violet has an anointing for victory to walk into it herself and to usher other people into it. And the Lord is just saying, this little girl has this victory anointing and she already has the victory over these symptoms. And man, when I, when I heard that, when that, you know, I gave the interpretation over myself, but as I was saying it out, I felt such a wave of peace and encouragement wash over me. And I was like, man, I don't even care about those symptoms. I know who Violet is. I know her eternal like gifting, like what God has put on the inside of her. We can do this in every situation of our lives. So many times we don't know what to do. We don't know how to respond to things, you know, but your spirit always does and you can always pray in the Holy Spirit and then you can ask for the interpretation of that and you can be encouraged and you can have, uh, you know, wisdom and a strategy and, and knowledge of how to respond that completely you didn't have before. Let's go to the next slide. Romans 8, uh, verse 26 says, In the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. There have been a couple of times in my life, handful of times, where out of nowhere I just felt this burden to pray in tongues. It was almost like an anxiety, a physical like um, tension that I could feel. And... As I begin praying in tongues, I could feel a, a, an alleviation, like it would begin, it like, 
ah, like this is definitely what I need to be doing. And there have even been times where I was praying in tongues and it started to come out in like, I don't know, just a weird way, like a, a groaning. And this is, I experienced this actually before I was even familiar with this verse. Or maybe I'd read it but didn't understand what it was and I was describing to my dad like what happened because I was still in my teens. I was like, dad, am I just getting off into really weird stuff? And my dad's like, no, you're groaning in the spirit. There's some situation that was going on in my life and the Holy Spirit interceded. He intervened in that situation and began inspiring me to allow him to speak through me into that situation. And there have been times where I, um, man, there was one time we were in a church service and my dad all of a sudden just had this burden to pray in tongues. And we found out later that evening that a friend of ours was in the ER, that he had some sort of catastrophic something happened on the inside of him and he was projectile vomiting blood. And my dad, a full like two hours before we even knew about it, was, man, just praying in tongues with a fervor that I had never seen before. And I believe that it was instrumental in our friend recovering from that experience. You don't, we can't understand the amount of leverage that we have when we properly when we engage in tongues, when we allow that to be part of our walk, our relationship with God, uh, there are just so many ways that it impacts and benefits us and other people. Your family is going to be benefited when you are encouraged in the Lord more, when you are built up more in your faith, when you are experiencing all these benefits. Everyone around you, the people here at church, are going to be benefiting even more. Amen? Let's go to the next slide. Um, really quickly, how to receive the gift of tongues. First, you need to be born again. Um, you need to ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, in Luke chapter 11, Jesus says that how much, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? So you just ask. When I received the gift of the Holy Spirit, I was like seven years old. I went up for prayer. I just asked for it. The woman who was praying for me was my best friend's mom, and I had a really big crush on her at the time. I was super embarrassed. I remember being in line. I was like, please don't let me put, get put with Kim. Please don't let me get... And of course, I got put with Kim. I was like, I'm going to try to start speaking tongues in front of her. I don't... I was like really not in a perfect headspace to experience this, but I prayed. I asked genuinely, and I remember she was like, no, just, just let it out. Just say something. And I remember being like, and she's like, that's it, yay, you know, that was it. I did not have a profound, you know, powerful experience with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was simply, I just asked, believed I received, and then I just began speaking in tongues. That was it. I know some people have really moving, amazing experiences in this. That's great. I'm really happy for that. But that is not the benchmark for a genuine Holy Ghost baptism experience. It is good enough to just ask that to believe that your Father is good enough to give you that good gift. Amen? And then by faith, to speak syllables that form words that you don't understand. Yep, I think it always feels silly for the most part, um, especially when you have an experience like mine that wasn't just really remarkable. You just do it by faith. Your spirit prays. When I begin moving my mouth and forming these syllables that I don't understand, yeah, to me, to a linguist who's going to uh, evaluate it and look for the traits of actual language, yeah, it's gibberish. It doesn't have any of the traits of a human language. But that's no problem because, yeah, my mouth is moving, but my spirit is praying. Your spirit is communicating itself. Let's go to the next slide. Understand that you are moving your mouth. You are moving your mouth but your spirit is expressing itself. Praying, worshiping, speaking hidden wisdom of God. Oh, let's skip this. Uh, I'm already well over time, so we just need to wrap it up. Uh, if I ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit, but I never speak in tongues, did that, did that, does that mean it didn't work? Answer? The next slide will say, no, that's not what it means. It just means that you have not made the decision to speak in tongues yet. If you ask, the Holy Spirit was given to you. I don't care if you never speak in tongues. And nobody should try to tell you that you didn't have a legitimate experience. You're just not speaking in tongues yet. You're missing out, but that's okay. I feel silly when I do this. Is that normal? Yes, it is. <laughs> 
it, it gets better with, with practice. And, you know, you do, the more you do it, the better it gets, the more natural it feels. Uh, I could get up in front of anybody and pray in tongues, and it's just, it's just natural and beautiful and, and normal to me. I recommend that you pray in tongues often. You can't do it too much. When you're driving, when you're showering, when you're doing dishes, doing chores. Um, I pray in tongues every night when I'm putting Violet back to sleep. She wakes up a lot. I go in there and I just pray in tongues over her. And I just imagine all the ways that my prayers are going into her right now, into her future. I'm imagining breakthroughs she's going to experience because of prayers that I'm praying right now. That's not a pat on the back to myself about how great I am. It's like how awesome God is, how amazing he is. Ask the Lord to give you the interpretation of what you pray. That's really beautiful, really important. There are benefits you get even when you don't interpret your tongues, but it's like, well, why miss out? Ask for it, and if you get something, you get even more than what you already were getting. Uh, the next slide. Write down the interpretation that you get, no matter how simple it may be. So often God just tells me that he loves me. Lord, interpret what I just said. I love you with an everlasting love. That's beautiful. I need to meditate on that even more than I already do. Remember that this is a spiritual tool to build you up in your faith, to give you access to the hidden wisdom of God, and to help you stand firm against enemy attacks. He's a trickster. He's a liar. He's defeated. He has no power over you. He has no authority over you. You have authority over him. You have a power over his work in your life and in the lives of others. So just let, the, let praying in tongues be something that just builds you up in all of that. And I think that's the last slide. Yeah, that's it. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the gift of tongues. Thank you that you have given us something that is so powerful, so effective, meant to benefit and bless and build us up, Lord God, and meant to be a blessing to, uh, to others around us. Lord God, I believe that I'm speaking for this entire congregation when I say I, I just ask, Holy Spirit, you, that you would move even more in the ministry gift of tongues when we gather here. I ask that your people would be yielded to you, would be fearless and willing to step out, Lord God. Give us open hearts, sensitive hearts, Lord God, and give us um, wisdom and maturity and sensitivity to just um, walk into this and, and receive more and more of it, Lord God. And I just ask that you would inspire all of us to pray in tongues in our private lives and just experience everything that you intended us to receive from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.